aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il dito. aspettavano così perché credo in quello che dico questo e basta? sì Don Giussani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo l'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte da cui viene il dito. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. A Passion for Man, this is the title, the soul of the 43rd edition of the Meeting of Rimini, to which I welcome you all. I uh, welcome everybody. At the meeting of 1985, Don Giussani 
said with all the impetus that characterized his person, all of this is born out of a passion for man. And this is where the title of the meeting is springs from, on the centenary of his birth. During this time, this very dramatic time, with the conflict in Ukraine, with many suffering, with much suffering amongst the population that makes the construction of peace, the building of peace, more and more difficult and more and more urgent. The challenges regarding climate change also urge us to take action. We have also needed to face problems linked to energy because of the war and the growing division during this difficult and time of crisis is not helping. We are seeing as more and more important the fragility that is face that our, that our culture and our society are facing. We are in front of a crossroads. Either these contradictions lead us to a greater crisis and an indifference with a sense of rebellion and anger, or the questions which bring suffering and struggle help us to get to a freedom that helps us to solve these problems with creativity and with the spirit of um, initiative. This will happen. The second option is possible. The more we uh, let ourselves be nourished by the provocation of Jusani, a passion for man, to help us avoid uh, getting caught up in a cynical vision of man and of our history so that our in our history we can begin once again with this passion this infinite passion for every one of us for each person this is the approach with which we will live this meeting with the great questions the cultural questions, the questions linked to our current economic climate, and of course, the questions linked to the education of our future generations. The Pope also gave us a message to help us gain a greater awareness of what we are doing. I will tell you through the letter that was written by his Bishop Francesco Lambiasi. Most Reverend Excellency, the Holy Father sends you his warmest greetings and entrusts to you through me this message for the next meeting for Friendship Among Peoples, entitled A Passion for Man. On the centenary of the birth of the Servant of God, Monsignor Luigi Zussani, the organizers intend to gratefully remember his apostolic zeal which drove him to meet so many people and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to each one. In fact, he said in his speech at the 1985 meeting, Christianity was not born to found a religion. It was born as a passion for man, love for man, veneration for man, tenderness for man, passion for man, absolute esteem for man. Sometimes it seems that history has turned its back on this gaze of Christ on man. Pope Francis has emphasized this on many occasions. The fragility of the times in which we live is also the following, to believe that there is no possibility of redemption, a hand that lifts you up, an embrace that saves you, forgives you, lifts you up, floods you with an infinite, patient, forgiving love. 
it puts you back on track. This is the most painful aspect of the experience of so many who experienced loneliness during the pandemic or had to abandon everything to escape the violence of war. Here, then, the parable of the Good Samaritan is today more than ever a key word, a, a key concept, because it is evident how men in their innermost being are waiting for the Samaritan to come to their aid, that he should bend over them pour oil on their wounds, take care of them, and bring them shelter. Ultimately, they know that they need God's mercy and his gentleness, a saving love that is freely given. The Gospel points to the Good Samaritan as a model of unconditional passion for every brother and sister encountered along the way. And for this reason, it has a profound assonance with the theme of the meeting. Let us care for the needs of every man and woman, young and old, with the same fraternal spirit of care and closeness that marked the Good Samaritan. It's not just a matter of generosity, which some have more of and others less. Here, Jesus wants to put us in front of the deep root of the gesture of the Good Samaritan. Pope Francis describes it this way. They compel us to recognize Christ himself in each of our abandoned or excluded brothers and sisters. Faith has untold power to inspire and sustain our respect for others. For believers come to know that God loves every man and woman with an infinite love and thereby confers infinite dignity upon all humanity. We likewise believe that Christ shed his blood for each of us and that no one is beyond the scope of his universal love. The mystery never ceases to amaze us, as Don Giussani himself testified in the presence of St. John Paul II on, 30, on the 30th of May, 1998. What is man that you should remember him? The son of man that you should take, that you should care for him. No question has ever struck me in my, in life like this question. There was only one man in the world who could answer me asking a new question. What advantage will man have if he gains the whole world and then loses himself? Or what will man be able to give in return for himself? Christ alone takes my humanity to heart. It is this passion of Christ for the destiny of each creature that must animate the believer's gaze towards everyone, a gratuitous love without measure and without measure, without limit. But we ask ourselves, might this not appear to be a pious intention compared to what we see happening in the world today, in the clash of all against all, where selfishness and vested interest seem to look at those around us as an asset to be respected, seem to dictate the vested interests seem to dictate the agenda in the lives of individuals and nations? How is it possible to look at those around us as an asset to be respected, cherished and cared for? How is it possible to bridge the distance that separates us from one another? The pandemic and war seem to have widened the gulf, setting back the path to a more united and supportive hum humanity. But we know that the road to fraternity is not drawn on clouds. It crosses the many spiritual deserts present in our societies. In the desert, said Pope Benedict XVI, we discover the value of what is essential for living. Thus, in today's world, there are innumerable signs, often expressed implicitly or negatively, of the thirst for God for the ultimate meaning of life. And in the desert, people of faith are needed who, with their own lives, point 
at the way to the promised land and keep hope alive. Pope Francis does not tire in pointing out the way through the desert to bring life. Our commitment does not consist exclusively in activities or programs of promotion and assistance. What the Holy Spirit mobilizes is not an unruly activism, but above all, an attentiveness which considers the other, in a certain sense, as one with ourselves. This loving attentiveness is the beginning of a true concern for their person, which inspires me effectively to seek their good. Recovering this awareness is decisive. A person cannot make the journey of self-discovery alone. The encounter with the other is essential. In this sense, the Good Samaritan shows us that our existence is intimately connected to that of others, and that the relationship with the other is a condition for becoming fully ourselves and bearing fruit. By giving us life, God has in some way given us himself so that we, in turn, give ourselves to others. A human being is made in such a way that he does not fulfill himself, does not develop and cannot find his own fullness except through a sincere gift of himself. Father Giussani added that charity is a moved gift of self. Indeed, it is moving to think that God, the Almighty, bent over our nothingness, took pity on us, and loved us one by one with an eternal love. What is the fruit of those who, imitating Jesus, make a gift of themselves? Social friendship that excludes no one and a fraternity open to all. An embrace that breaks down walls and goes out to meet the other in the knowledge of the value of each individual concrete person in whatever situation they find themselves. A love for the other, for what he or she is, a creature of God, made in his image and likeness, therefore endowed with an intangible dignity, which no one can dispose of or worse, abuse. It is this social friendship that, as believers, we are invited to nourish with our witness. The evangelizing community puts itself through works and gestures in the daily lives of others, shortens distances, stoops to the point of humiliation if necessary, and takes on human life, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in the people. How much do men and women of our time need to meet people who do not give lessons from a pedestal, but take to the streets to share the daily toil of living, sustained by a reliable hope. Pope Francis insists on calling Christians to this historic task for the good of everyone in the certainty that the source of the dignity of every human being and the possibility of a universal fraternity is the gospel of Jesus embodied in the life of the Christian community. If the music of the gospel stops vibrating within us, we will have lost the joy that springs from compassion, the tenderness that is born out of trust, the capacity for reconciliation that finds its source in always knowing how to forgive one another. If the music of the gospel stops playing in our homes, in our squares, in our workplaces, in politics and in the economy, we will have extinguished the melody that provoked us to fight for the dignity of every man and woman. The Holy Father hopes that the organizers and participants of the 2022 meeting 
will accept this appeal with a glad and willing heart, continuing to collaborate with the Universal Church on the path of friendship between peoples, expanding in the world the passion for man. And while entrusting this intention to the intercession of Most Holy Mary, I cordially send the apostolic blessing. Formulating my personal wish for a meeting that fully responds to, your, to the expectations, I confirm with senses of distinguished reverence your Excellency, Most Reverend Pietro Cardinal Parolin, Secretary of State. So, um, I first of all would love to thank the, the Holy Father for these words that will obviously will be picked up on on um, many moments of discussion this meeting and in many other conferences. Even the President of the Republic, Sergio Mattarello, Mattarella has honoured us with a message. The Rimini meeting once again this year proposes itself as a precious occasion for dialogue a place for this to happen, an open space for knowledge and culture, for discussion. An event that has been renewed uh, for 43 years, a proof of its deep roots, and thus continues to make its own contribution to the growth of our society by stimulating the conscience of so many young people. The title chosen for the 2022 edition a passion for man is endowed with great strength, increased if possible by the context in which we live. More than ever, the theme of the dignity of the person, its defense, the safeguarding of his freedom and his integrity is at the heart of the challenge facing contemporary people. First and foremost, it is the theme of the right to life. Not far from us, right in the heart of Europe, a dastardly war is being fought, provoked by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. Europe has risen from Nazi fascism precisely by renouncing the will to power and the war that is its direct consequence. Totalitarian, totalitarianism and ideologies based on both ethnic national and ideological supremacy. This war of invasion with the mourning, destruction, the hatred that continue, it continues to generate shake the whole of humanity and its founding values and Europe in its own very identity. Passion for mankind on the other hand has peace as its premise democratic coexistence as its horizon, cooperation between peoples, social equity, respect for each person in his freedom, his rights, his diversity, an aspiration, a hope, a duty that stems from the deepest conscience and desire of individuals and communities, an enterprise that challenges us all. It challenges us in the, uh, the area of protection of each person, as in the case of the fight against the pandemic, starting with those weakest and those most in difficulty. It challenges us in the area of our capacity for solidarity, for acceptance and for integration. It calls us to a sense of justice that will not tolerate regression as poverty and marginalization increase. The person is at the centre and comes before everything else. It is always fidelity to the person that confronts us with the greatest challenge of our time. Saving the planet from the exploitation for which man himself is responsible. Ours is a time, as Pope Francis repeats, of integral ecology. Man must rebuild the balance with the environment and natural resources and can only do so in a spirit of solidarity. Daily action must be inspired 
by a vision that sees us aware that we are participants and creators of a greater history. Inspired by coherence, even in the smallest gestures. In this spirit, I extend my cordial greetings and wish fruitful days to all those who will take part in the, in the meeting and to the numerous community of volunteers who organize it all. Sergio Mattarella. On everyone's behalf, I thank the, the President uh, Mattarella. We will surely be following his invitation to, to be creators and part and uh, protagonists of a greater uh, movement. I'm very happy that we're able to launch this meeting with the uh, the, an interview with these people, three people which Pope Francis has called peacemakers and who live actively the, the conciliation of peace and who have suffered personally. I thank for their presence, all of them, this morning. His Eminence, the Cardinal uh, Diodoné Napalinga, the Archbishop of Bangui in the Central African Republic. along with Paolo Pezzi and Pier Battista Piazzabella, who will be joining us. Saluto Sua Eccellenza, Monsignor Pier Battista. I thank and welcome His Excellency, Monsignor Pier Battista Piazzabella, Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. And joining us virtually, I greet His Excellency Monsignor Paolo Pezzi, Metropolitan Archbishop of the Mother of God in Moscow. La guerra in Ucraina. The war in the Ukraine in Ukraine has made us aware that peace, the relative peace Europe has been enjoying since 1945 isn't something we can take for granted, but has rather made us more uh, aware of the war, many wars around the world that sadly too often we've forgotten. Even right now, there are millions of people who cry out with, uh, either with raised or with hushed voices about their, their suffering that's been caused by war, by torture, by deportation. You have decided to hear these cries of the people in your care, and you've spared no expense to be close to them, to, to, to welcome them, even in the, in the smallest possible ways, to promote reconciliation, friendship, and brotherhood. Here is the question with which we've invited you, Your Eminence. In the middle of so many conflicts, even such violent ones in your continent, there have been many moments of reconciliation. How is it possible to overcome the, the challenges and the dangers which even uh, of injustice that continues to self-perpetuate. How do we not surrender to the, the, the desire, the strong desire for revenge? To you, is, uh, we'll refer now. Thank you for coming to us. Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here. 
you know, I, I won't talk in Italian for too long. My uh, speech here will be in French. Artisans for peace, a passion for conciliation. The world today is in a really is in need of peace. Peace is becoming the most precious good that humanity is seeking. This search for peace is done in various ways and with various means. Some have thought that true peace is that which is obtained by force. In other words, by the use of arms. In this sense, and in this logic, peace is equated with the victory of a strong party over a weak one. The victory of those who have the most firepower over those who have too little. This approach, which is very much relevant today in our world, defines peace as the absence of war, as the absence of conflict. Peace is simply a state of non-belligerence, therefore. Peace is the abdication of one of the protagonists of open conflict. In reality, this is the purely political conception of peace. In our world, however, other people have a different conception of peace. Peace is the ability to renounce violence, even when one is able to do so. To renounce violence even when violence would be an easier means. Peace is obtained through dialogue. It is the fruit of an agreement often reached after immense hardship. Making peace requires that we also come down from our own pedestals to meet each other as another, as other human beings. This peace has its true roots in God. Therefore, we receive it directly from Jesus Christ, who gave his life to reconcile peoples, races, nations. According to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, Christ is our peace, who made two into one and broke down the dividing wall. This comes from the Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 14. How can we be peacemakers today in a global context where, a block, where alliance blocks are created, where the axes of good and evil are drawn up? Our intervention is intended to be a sharing of experiences of our commitment to the, di to the very difficult path of reconciliation and of peace in the Central African Republic but is equally valid in the world as a whole. Point one, making peace in times of war. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. From the Gospel of uh, Matthew, chapter five, verse nine. In order to reconcile people in conflict, one must be a peacemaker in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Beyond the simple etymological or definitional framework, peace is above all a commitment. It's an, an existentialist determination to create a framework of life where living together is made possible. As such, this can only happen if we draw from the deepest depths of our humanity the required energies. I draw these energies more from the Bible, where the words that give peace and bring life come out. Making peace in times of war may seem illusory, 
or even utopian, but it is not a de facto impossibility. To be a peacemaker requires a great capacity for judgment and analysis. In order to be able to have a fair and objective hermeneutic of the situation and the belligerence in process, the peacemaker does, should not choose sides. They should be on the side of everyone, be impartial but without ever hiding or betraying the truth. I still have memories of those dark days that my country, the Central African Republic, experienced and everything it has gone through and suffered. Indeed, when the rebels took control of the country in 2013, human rights violations were particularly commonplace. As a bishop and as a pastor, I never ceased to denounce the, uh, the crimes committed against the civilian population and the reprisals against people who were left to their own sad fate. One day, a group of Romanian businessmen came in the name of the authorities to offer me 80,000 euros. I refused. Otherwise, I could not continue to defend the weak and the oppressed. They would have succeeded in buying my silence. Prayer and the word of God were the main sources of my fight against evil. And widespread opposition. I let myself be driven by St. Paul's exhortation to Timothy. Before God and before Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, I solemnly ask you, in the name of his manifestation and his kingdom, proclaim the word, intervene whenever you can in opportune and inopportune moments, denounce evil, reprove, Encourage, but with great patience and with a concern to instruct. The second letter of St. Paul, chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. This is a certainly arduous, difficult path, one full of thorns in our way, but we must always take it. We must always advance along this path of trials and tribulations even in the darkest night of unknow the unknown. And we must always dare to, to open a breach and to let the light shine and look for a glimmer of hope. Point two, perseverance and resilience. Experience shows us that very often our passion to reconcile or our desire to reunite, to bring ourselves together, is appreciated in, dare, in various manners by the, the parties we're trying to bring together. We may be seen as a target, an inconvenient witness that ought to be removed. I still remember some of those dark days, dramatic moments of the crisis in the Central African Republic. I have this strong conviction that if we truly and resolutely put ourselves at the service of peace, we receive in return a kind of invisible strength that helps us get through these trials. I've personally experienced the powerful and the active hand of God in these difficult days. And I can say definitely God is victorious, and I have seen this countless times with my own eyes over these, those dark periods. I travelled all over Bangui, the capital, without ever being stopped, or ever being arrested. When I heard that the rebels were looting somewhere, I would rush in 
and sometimes arrive in time to chase them away before they manage to take anything. I would run after the armed rebels with my bare hands, but driven and determined by the power of faith, guided, as the apostle said, by my faith. He said, I believed and therefore I spoke. I came especially to comfort, to console and to reassure people. It was my priests, my pastoral workers and my faithful who were in danger above all. The wolf was lurking, he wanted to devour them, but I was not going to abandon my flock. Besides, I was not only defending Christians, but rather human beings. Muslims and Protestants were in equal need of help. As Pope Francis once said to me, in Bangui there was only one voice left, and that was your voice. This single voice sounded even louder and more sympathetic because I was not alone. I was with my brothers, the Imam in charge of the uh, Islamic community of the CAR and the pastor in charge of the Protestant churches of the CAR. Together we were taking these risks. We were ready to die together to defend justice and the cause we deemed to be just giving voice to the voiceless, the voice of the silent majority, terrified by the horror of their violence that surrounded them. To tell the truth, I was not the only one targeted. One day, while President Jotodia was visiting Benin, he was interviewed by journalists about the situation in the Central African Republic. In essence, he explained that peace was returning to Bongi. Other journalists went to see Reverend Nicholas Gerekoyame Gambongu and from, from the platform of the Confessions and asked him what he thought of the, uh, what the president had stated. He was very direct about the comments of the president. I don't know if President Jotardia has intelligence agents here, but what is happening here in Bongi is anything but peace. Obviously, this remark came back to Michel Jotardia's ears, and two days later, the pastor was summoned and was arrested. Before heading down to the police station, he warned me. He managed to, to get word to me I'm under arrest, he said. Therefore, I got changed, I grabbed some clothes and a jumper, and I went down to the police station. I greeted the commissioner, who's a Christian, and I told him, this pastor denounced and proclaimed the real truth, and now he's been arrested. I've come, therefore, to hand myself in to imprisonment alongside him. The policeman was really annoyed. From 6 p.m. to 11.30 p.m., I stayed outside. I sat there on a chair outside his office. And finally, I was able to drive the pastor home. We managed to get him freed at 1 a.m. They were planning to leave him at the police station for two days in with the idea of intimidating him. But solidarity thwarted this plan. And this episode brought us much closer to the Protestant community. I firmly believe that ecumenism is also built in these trials, is built in fact. 
making peace means moving the lines. True peace is not only made with friends, but more with those who are considered our enemies. We must invent words that move boundaries, words that liberate, words that give forgiveness. When human language creates its own words for peace, for harmony, for living together, for love, then our humanity will be restored and we can once again sing the hymn to love and let life flow through each of us. Our language today is full of words linked to war, violence, hatred, resentment, revenge. The peacemaker is someone who must invent a new lexical field devoid of hatred. I am often irritated and outraged when I see speeches on television that tend to fan the flames and call for weapons to be sent in. Let us not forget that violence breeds violence. We must learn to get out of this spiral and this logic of war by wanting to settle everything with weapons. The survival of our humanity depends on it. I have the impression that the survival of our humanity is at stake. I have the impression that our humanity has not yet learned the lessons of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The logic of war and supremacy is a real threat to the human race and to our world, which is suspended from the unbridled appetites of the nuclear powers. It is as if humanity is preparing for the last war against man. Martin Luther King said that we must learn to live together as brothers or we will all die together as fools. Congratulations. In 2013, while the war was in full swing in the Central African Republic, I met a 16-year-old boy in the bush who had become a general. I spoke to him about education towards peace. To my great surprise and even astonishment, he replied, here, when a person does not obey and of speech as a weapon of persuasion, he is left with, the, with biceps to bulge. In other words, the power of violence. God's complaint through the words of the prophet Hosea immediately rang in my ears. My people perish for lack of knowledge. That is why I ask in the name of God and in the name of peace to have the courage to move the boundaries by giving a culture, by cultivating a culture of non-war, a culture of peace to our humanity. For the prophet Isaiah warns us, here in Italy, in Italy, I would ask you, have you got communities, Ukrainian and Russian communities, do they build bridges amongst them here in Italy in order to have a dialogue between them? And they work and to work and to eat with these communities and to pray with these communities. This would be the beginning of peace. The language, 
the true peace cannot be obtained through the use of force, of weapons. True peace comes once the causes of conflicts and wars are known. Conflicts usually arise from situations of systemic injustice. injustice. Globalization must not be seen today as the exclusion of the weakest. The exclusion of the weakest or the extinction of nations that have long been dispossessed and dominated. On the contrary, globalization must be an opportunity in which all nations are symphonically called upon to participate in the concert of well-being and happiness and thus in the advent of peace. We have only one human essence. The fate of all humanity is now linked. The, may, the many conflicts in Africa must challenge our universal conscience. The construction of walls and alliance blocks in the West must remind us of the need for solidarity in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and everywhere else in the world. The crisis that we have experienced in the Central African Republic certainly had endogenous causes, internal causes, which were assimilated to the frustration of a part of the population that felt excluded. Legitimate demands led some of our compatriots to take up arms to claim their right to access basic state structures, such as water, electricity, hospitals, schools, roads, etc. These demands were then quickly followed by a series of other demands. These claims were then quickly exploited by certain external actors who began to publicize the conflict by attributing a religious connotation to it. Fortunately, thanks to the wisdom of God and the language of truth used, we were able to stand up to this dangerous international rhetoric, which was already beginning to talk about the inter-religious conflict between Muslims and Christians in the Central African Republic. Diplomacy is not a synonym of demagogy. We must learn from the mistakes of the past and make sure that amongst peoples and nations we can build bridges. I am firmly believe that all means that we have today can contribute to anticipate and resolve these international conflicts and create a situation of peace. We in Africa, we have tried to invest in education towards peace. The platform of the religious confessions played a, th a very important role in the res resolution of conflict in Africa. This platform is a credible space insofar as the word announced is translated into action. We showed an example of p Pacific building, a living together which is made possible through different confessions. We became Uh, we have tried to go against the instrumentalization of religion 
in the name of war. This space of dialogue is a mediating, plays a mediating role to save the unity the, between nations and religions. And to do this, to help the different communities and to help us see the other as another and to heal the wounds of this crisis. This platform has played a very important role the current crisis is not a religious crisis, it is a political crisis. And religion is not only a means, but it is serving the, uh, it is in service of disguised political desires. This interreligious platform aims to reconcile Central Africans with each other beyond their denominational allegiances. For this, a media campaign is initiated. Slices of emission in favor of peace, bringing together Christians and Muslims, happen regularly on the local radios. The principle of these steps is simple. Sow peace in hearts in the hearts and minds. Learn again to live always in unity, to walk together in, towards a conviviality. With our pilgrim staff in, staffs in hand, we travel to some of the world's major capitals to inform international opinion of the seriousness of the crisis, but also to solicit urgent aid for the population left to its own devices and lacking the bare minimum to survive. In addition to raising awareness about forgiveness, peace, justice and reconciliation, the platform also has a humanitarian dimension. Indeed, in collaboration with Caritas and other non-governmental organizations, it carries out activities with internally displaced persons in various sites thus placing its prophetic and salutary role. The platform of religious confessions of the Central African Republic is a credible space insofar as the word announced is translated into action. In conclusion, we can say that peace in a vertical way has its source in God. Christians receive it in Jesus Christ, who gives them, who charges them with the responsibility of sowing peace. This mission of as peacemakers is one of the major challenges of the risen Lord. And he made it a priority when he addressed his apostles. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Peace from a horizontal point of view is a behavior. And attitude, an inner disposition, a commitment, a determination to build bridges between peoples and nations. The peacemaker is a chosen one, a blessed one, who as a child of God is ready to give himself totally and passionately with res resilience, abnegation, to transform the face of our world, which has been scarred and disfigured by conflicts and wars for a very long time. It is to dare to move the boundaries. It is to have the courage to go beyond the artificial and rigid frontiers set by the current ideologies. We are condemned to live together to get along if we want to give humanity 
another chance to write a new history, the history of the Heralds of Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you for your words, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, the thanks have been repeated in French. We wanted to ask a question to Pizzaballa, which regards the conflicts and war in the Middle East. The conflicts and wars in the Middle East seem unresolvable. Many attempts have perhaps prevented further escalation, but real peace seems far off. Amidst rebellion and resignation, amidst so much empty rhetoric and misguided ideologies, how do you live your commitment to peace and justice? I imagine I will probably not have enough time, but I will try to respond in a brief way. To talk about peace and justice in the Holy Land is always exhausting. It is a task that we try to evade more and more often, both to avoid, as you say, rhetoric and empty ideology that for years have filled meetings, discussions and assemblies of various kinds, and of which today everyone is a bit saturated. We cannot stand it any longer. And because also, on the other hand, justice and peace seem to be an ever more distant mirage, which leaves feelings of frustration and mistrust, when not, if, if not a rebellion and resignation within our souls. For this reason, I avoid talking about it as much as possible. As pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, I consider it more fruitful to speak to my church community of unity of the capacity for good relations as something constitutive of the life of the church amongst ourselves and with everyone else, rather than words like peace and justice, in order to avoid lapsing into the banal and thus into insignificance. I am increasingly convinced, moreover, that one cannot speak of hope if one does not have faith, because hope is the child of faith. To speak of hope today without placing it within a context of faith and trust is rhetoric, pure rhetoric, as you say. But let us return to the question you asked me. Why then did I agree to speak here about justice and peace? I did so because you, oppose, you proposed that I approach this topic from a very specific angle a personal angle. I'm not, I haven't been asked to talk about justice and peace in an abstract sense, but how do I live my commitment to peace and justice in my life? This perhaps allows me to address the topic in a more concrete and meaningful way. If it is true today, in fact, that on a political and institutional level, talking about peace and justice in the Middle East and in the Holy Land is a bit like taking the side of those who are fighting windmills. It is also true that the desire for peace and justice must find a place in the heart of everyone, especially in those who have responsibilities. It must be clear to each one of us, especially for us believers, that the commitment to peace and justice is not an extra add-on in the life of faith, an accessory element that one can do without. On the contrary, faith in God immediately generates a desire for good for every man, or to put it in the words of the theme of this year's meeting, an irresistible passion for man, so that he may have a life worthy of his vocation as a person created in the image and likeness of God. Before saying how I live my commitment in this sense, however, I need at least briefly to outline the context in which I live, so it is clearer what this commitment consists of. and. I do not intend to present here the complex political, religious and social dynamics of the Holy Land. 
And apart from being fairly well known by now, at least in outline, there are countless studies on the subject that anyone can find. It would take too long and I think it would be uninteresting. It is sufficient to say that on a political and social level to which the religious one is attached, what is common to all, Israelis and Palestinians alike, is the lack of trust. No one trusts the other anymore, politically or socially. In both populations, people do not even want to hear about the so-called peace process after the many failures and betrayals of that process. Politics on both sides of the wall is weak. Five political elections in two years in Israel, no political elections in Palestine since 2005. Lack of political leadership, increasing polarization of political positions on both sides, lack of vision, huge economic and social disparities between Palestinians and Israelis. In Gaza, the situation is even more problematic. Two million people are locked inside a very small strip of land in a situation of severe po poverty with very high unemployment, without water and electricity for several hours during the day with a regime that is increasingly in trouble at the same time intrusive of the life of the population and institutions. On the West Bank, on the one hand, the expansion of settlements makes the prospects of a possible, albeit distant, agreement increasingly blurred. On the other, the Palestinian Authority's grip on life in the territory is ever weaker. There is also an increasingly deep and painful feeling among the Palestinians that their cause is being abandoned by the international community. The impression that the occupation of which they are victims no longer interests them as it once did, and that they are left alone to fight for their rights, for the independence of their country. The list of crisis aspects, in short, is long, but I will stop here. These are just a few of the elements that nevertheless underpin the life of the community in which I live, in which I have been called to work. How does this commitment shape my life and my role as a pastor, called to speak a clear word, a clear word of truth, certainly, but at the same time a word that gives confidence? words that open perspective horizons that does not that do not close me and my community in an attitude of resignation or rebellion first of all such a commitment must be a real personal conviction one cannot separate what one says from who says it this is what Yusan used to say we cannot separate what one says from the person who is saying it Witness credibility is the necessary precondition for any serious commitment. The work of a church that speaks out of, for justice and peace would make no sense and would not work. In any way, if its pastor did not truly believe in it, one must truly be convinced and deeply aware that in this torn context, commitment to justice and peace must be, as I said, the first and immediate expression of one's life, uh, of one's faith. If my primary task as a pastor is to safeguard God's presence in the real life of the community, it must also be clear to me that defending God's rights also means defending human rights and vice versa. These two aspects cannot be separated. Every pastor, moreover, necessarily brings his personality, his own life experience, his way of feeling and his history his personal history to this personal commitment. I need to believe in it and bring my personal experience into it. It would not make sense for me, for example, to talk about justice and peace in the same way that my predecessor pastors such as Patriarch Sabah, who had been a, an, a hero in this context, and how he used to talk about it. And this is both because times have changed and because I have come from a different history and experience and my commitment in order to be credible must be consistent with what I am. At the same time it is important to be aware that my being here in the Holy Land as a pastor is not random but is given to me by providence and that providence at this time needs a commitment to justice and peace according to my style, my personal experience, which I have the duty to pass on to my community. I'm also aware, of course, that communication must be a two-way street. My story, my personality and experience must be enriched by listening to and participating with my community, which has the right to find in me an attentive and understanding heart. And what then is my, my personal style? What is dear to me in this commitment? What disturbs and troubles me? 
I believe that one cannot speak seriously about justice and peace from a Christian perspective without adding the word forgiveness, which in the Holy Land is considered almost as a taboo. I am convinced that it will not be possible to overcome today's obstacles on the road to reconciliation, nor to project a peaceful future if one does not have the courage to purify one's reading of history from the enormous baggage of pain and injustice that still heavenly conditions the present and the choices that are often made today. It is not a question of forgetting, certainly. However, it will be very difficult to build a serene future if one places being a victim as the basis of one's personal, social and national identity instead of basing one's perspectives on a common hope. Forgiveness is a necessary ingredient to overcome this impasse. There can be no purification of relationships if one does not have the courage to talk about forgiveness, to start paths of recon reconciliation, not only at the level of small niches of groups, but in a more general context, both political and religious. It is not an obvious task. In the Israeli-Palestinian political context, forgiveness is understood as a synonym for renouncing the defense of one's rights. The various local, cultural and religious matrices also have a huge influence on this issue. Judaism, Islam and Christianity, that is, have a very different approaches to the experience of forgiveness, which is often understood by all as a synonym for weakness. This discourse, however, requires, first of all, my personal readiness to live forgiveness, to be reconciled myself, to make my community see in me that reconciliation and forgiveness are not words, but a lived life, visible and tangible, and that forgiveness generates peace. They must see within me a pacified person, cap capable of making a vital, synthesis, a vital summary between faith in God and life. As far as the impact on the real life of my people is concerned, there is an a certain question which is not easy to answer. How can I help how can I help them rethink their history and purify their memory? How can I speak of forgiveness to my people as long as their present is marked by injustice and pain? For you Italians it is easy to talk about peace, justice and forgiveness. But for us who live inside these difficulties every day, how do you think it is possible to talk about forgiveness? I am often told this. It is not an easy question to answer, I said. A difficult and always painful reconciliation and unity which does not always work. It is always, it is often painful. Remaining within this laceration, this division and living it is also part of my service without having the pretension of imposing solutions, but simply being in this expectation that is both trusting and painful, full of hope in a change that is possible tiring, but founded in faith in the providential God. And here's another aspect which is little talked about, and that's the essential one in the, uh, the service I perform, solitude. Committing oneself to, to justice and peace together with forgiveness is not something that arouses immediate understanding. <clears throat> It's required to accept uh, solitude as a as part, a, a real tool for uh, for our your work to be valuable and to bear fruit. For many years, it's accompanied me uh, a certain gospel passage in discerning these things, and it's the dramatic choice made between Jesus and Barabbas by the people. It's a choice that's placed before each of us every day, really. Pilate shows the people two messianic figures, Jesus and Barabbas. Barabbas, which in Arabic literally means like uh, son of Abba. It's an Aramaic title. It's the title that mimics the, the figure of Jesus, the real Bar Abba, the son of the father, who calls his own father Abba in the Bible. Barabbas was an activist, as we'd say today. He fought for the liberation of his people. He had his own following. He wanted justice, freedom, dignity for his people. He was a simple, concrete, attractive messiah, not at all utopian. And on the other side, there was Jesus. As the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, I found myself from the very beginning in a situation that requires a choice, a clear, precise stance in the face of the more or less armed conflict I described at the beginning. 
how do I reconcile this call to take sides with who I am and what I've just said about forgiveness? More generally, I frequently ask myself about the question of how can I defend the rights of God and man in this context? That is, how to speak of forgiveness, how to be faithful to Christ who freely forgives on the cross without giving the impression of me not defending the flock entrusted to me, its rights and its expectations. What does it mean concretely to be on the side of Jesus and not of Barabbas? How to preach love to enemies without giving the impression of unwittingly confirming one narrative over the other, Israeli against Paris, the Palestinian or vice versa. In the Middle East, in Jerusalem, as in Aleppo, every Christian like me is faced with this dramatic choice. Jesus or Barabbas, to die on the cross or to fight? How can one speak of liberation from the bondage of sin and of forgiveness when your people suffer under the domination of a foreign authority? Is it permissible to measure pain and loss of life by the criterion of quantity? You know, if we suffered 15, you more, us less. More concretely, I'm often asked, how can I think of forgiving the Israeli who oppresses me as long as I am under oppression? Wouldn't that mean giving him the upper hand on me, giving him free reign without defending my rights? Before talking about forgiveness, is it not necessary that justice be done? The Israeli in turn may add, how can I possibly forgive those who kill my people? These are questions behind which there is a real and sincere pain. In the end of the day, Barabbas isn't that bad at all. In fact, he sounds quite reasonable now. It's clear that choosing Christ is not choosing indifference in the world's evil. There's the mentality of Barabbas, the fundamentalist who wants to make some sort of new crusade that's also the indifference of a disembodied Christianity. Yet, at the end of the day, the Christian should choose Christ, and he died on the cross, failed and defeated. From a strictly human point of view, there's no doubt that forgiveness resembles defeat. Jesus didn't solve any of the social and political problems of his time. He didn't liberate man from this or, you know, things got even worse after he lived. He didn't liberate people from this oppression, from that oppression. He didn't bring about any liberation, but in, rather he brought about the liberation. He reclaimed at its deepest root the relationship between God and man and of men among themselves. Faced with evil in the world, then, conclusion then, my duty as a pastor is to say that the Christian's task is to suffer, to die on the cross like Jesus, to allow himself to be pierced and to be defeated. Is, is this what I need to spread to people? Is this what I'm trying to say? That the Christian has nothing to say in the face of drama before him? No, absolutely not. Faced with the situation in the Middle East, the Christian certainly does as much as anyone else because justice, peace, freedom, dignity, equality among men are attitudes of which he has personal experience, which belong to him, and which he wants to become common to all. The Christian wants to fight and to collaborate with everyone without an exclusion to bring about this view and this hope for peace in the Middle East. The Christian fights for dignity in the Middle East and wants to fight for justice because they belong to the harmony that Christ returned to us but he doesn't let himself be upset by the evil that he sees, even if he suffers from it just like everyone else, because he has been freed and redeemed. According to Barabbas' mentality, however, this way of striving for justice and peace is a failure. It will lead nowhere. It's a strategy of wishful thinking with no future. According to this view, to Barabbas' view, Christianity in the Middle East is powerless, it's finished, it's crushed. The testimony of so many people, on the other hand, especially small, insignificant people who have nothing, tells us just that no matter how much is destroyed, this seed remains and life will be reborn anew. I'll come to a close a bit more quickly. I'd like to briefly talk about how about my uh, community in Gaza, just a couple of hundred people in a sea of two million, which has every right to feel crushed with the limitation of its rights. And yet it's a, it's a very active community, many uh, social acts with, for the poor, for the disabled. And I've never heard from them, people who would have every right to be, to be angry, any word of anger or revenge. 
They always are active and wish to push themselves and do more for the people. These who are already a poor community want to do more to help them, to help others. From the most small thing, bringing a, a fridge to someone who needs it, to, to make shoes for children, it seems foolish for us, but it's, it, it means everything for those who have nothing. This is a community that doesn't harbor any resentment. You know, in Gaza people say there's no future, but this doesn't give me any consolation. It, it's been amazing for me to hear that from so many young people who believe that the most important thing isn't just to bring shoes or bring a fridge to someone, but to give time to people who want to talk, to, to listen to those who want to be listened. And this gives us an impression of kind of how in small steps society moves forwards. Like the test, if think of the testimony from a friend of mine, Gada, who wants the wants the, the the courage to bring justice to her people, but every day she asks for, uh, Christ for the power to forgive. This isn't something that's worth just casting aside. You know, these people who live absolute poverty in maximum oppression, it's extremely difficult for them. And I'll I'll end it here. There could be a, many more things I could say, but I'll try and conclude quickly. I ask myself in my specific context constant, continually, what might be different from mine context to others in the way in which I stand in these complex situations and commit to true, lived and experienced justice and peace and not simply commit to empty rhetoric and ideology. I can say that it's good to be wary of those who offer certain, clear and easy answers. Easy answers in complex and wounded contexts like ours are always fallacious. I believe that it's often part of a question of, of being present, of, of living there in this wounded world, of sometimes accepting that there isn't really a solution that's easy, but we need to be close, we need to be neighborly, without trying to teach forgiveness, but to try to share. The only way to teach forgiveness, justice, and peace is to experience themselves, to experience them on your own, and to be a witness to them. An academic exercise or a political decision may ratify or explain something, but will never precede the decision to commit oneself to peace, to justice, and to forgiveness, which is the fruit only of the option of an open heart. Because let's face it, after all, forgiveness is just a synonym for love. And only a great love for God and for one's community can give foundation and meaning to our commitment to peace and justice and to such an authentically revolutionary gesture that is forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence, for this, uh, this clear and synthesis of the situation, of this witness to the authenticity and the, the concreteness that, that's quite surprised us of uh, the situation you live through, and which has certainly shows the signs of, of divine light in the two things, uh, talks we've heard. No one tries to seed themselves to the, the 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 thought that they can have immediate results which in the end becomes could either become just an alibi for for caring less or a pretext for further violence monsignor petsi thank you for for having joined us remotely the question we have for you The question which we wanted to ask you is this, how can we promote reconciliation when there's such profound divisions, not only in social life, but also within communities, within families? 
Thank you, and we'll listen to you now. Well, first of all, I have to say that it is not simple, it is not easy to follow two giants, the two giant witnesses that we have just listened to. First of all, I thank the meeting for the courage of this conference and for the passion that for more than 40 years has moved so many people to announce that Christ is our peace, as we have heard, and that he is the event, the present event, at every step of history. He is the eternal, the infinite, in history and in the world. I think that without the perspective of the eternal, of the, I would not not only be able to talk about, but live the reconciliation and peace. First of all, the concept of peace, the experience of peace is, is alas, the furthest thing from the human heart. Peace is one of the most repeated words, not only in world literature, but also in everyday speech, in political speeches, but in, in fact, in everyday speech. And we know very well that when there is so much talk about something, it is because such is what is being talked about is absent. The psalmist even complains, the Psalms complain to God about the paradox of this experience, namely that the more he speaks of peace, the more man wants war. This ha often happens to me, it's happened to me many times during the past months, years and decade not just the 24th of February, to hear of many believers, regardless of their ethnicity, be they African, Asian, American, these believers do not want or cannot hear talking about peace, talk about peace, yet they desire it from the depths of their hearts. My experience of confession, of confessing during Holy Week and Easter struck me a lot. On Holy Thursday and Friday, because I was struck by the fact that the vast majority, often in tears, confessed they came to confession not so much because of their sins, but because of this inability to refuse violence, to refuse the hatred that they felt rising in their hearts. For some of these, the only way to escape this which is also terrible, just as terrible, was through an indifference to try and not think about the hatred. This made me realize that the experience of peace, the gift of peace, is not, first and foremost, a human achievement. We can strive all we want, but we will not achieve peace after a certain step on a certain path. We should remind ourselves of this more often, perhaps. Hatred, this evil anger, are not a part of our human experience. They come into it because we let it in. In the so 
we let it in. We let in the sword of Satan, of lies. We must therefore ask for peace and want to welcome it into our relationships. Peace is a gift and as such must be first welcomed and acknowledged. Jesus tells his friends shortly before dying that he will be the one to give peace. And it will be a different peace from the one that the world offers. For the world, peace is the establishment of a certain power. And it is usually always postponed to the future. And it is necessary for some to make sacri certain sacrifices, which is usually the poorest, while others do not have to make these sacrifices. It is therefore always a lie, this concept of peace that the world offers. For Jesus, peace is instead a present experience that communicates the effective certainty of the relationship with him. Of course, fear is everywhere. But the darkest night can be enlightened by this light. What happened to me in the north of Russia in winter when it was pitch black at night I had an interesting experience. At one point, the, the night is very, very dark in that region of Russia, in the north of Russia. But at one point, a myriad of stars, infinitely distant, tiny dots, illuminated that oppressive darkness. A friend recently said uh, said to me, who remembers the official in Auschwitz, the torturer of Auschwitz? But we all know who Maximilian Kolbe is. Or who remembers the person that we remember during the readings of the Mass? who uh, in, with injustice imprisoned Jeremiah. Those lights, those tiny dots of light enlighten and are not, uh, don't, are not turned off. It is important, necessary to see these real points of construction of peace that are already present. They are not to be postponed, they are not postponed to the future, they are present here. It has always struck me that the risen Jesus greets his own with the words, peace be with you. Where there is no effort, it is an absolutely natural gesture to his risen, for his risen person, a sign of gratuitousness without bounds. So much so that when I became a bishop, the bishop at the beginning of the Holy Mass greets the people with these same words as the risen Jesus. I used to tremble the first few times I greeted the faithful with this, with these words, peace be with you. After the greeting, Jesus does not linger too long to point out the apostles' lack of faith and trust, let alone our lack of faith and trust, but gives them 
the mandate to reconcile and baptize. Reconciliation, baptism, and mercy are experiences that prolong the permanence of the eternal, that prolong the perspective of the eternal in history. In eternity, there won't be any Christianity. There won't be any mercy anymore. There will be no more baptism and forgiveness. These experiences serve us now like they are, they are as necessary to us now as bread is necessary for us to survive, like air is necessary to breathe. The experience of reconciliation or communion or friendship is exactly the same image of those tiny dots in the pitch black night. And it is also the only necessary thing that Christians bring, that can bring to the world. Everybody needs it. We can create good relationships, relationships with everyone and everything, but no one apart from Christians have this responsibility and this opportunity, the following the following responsibility, that is to bring forgiveness. And I would say that everybody needs this. And even rightly so, Pope Francis says, we have a right, not only need it, we, we have a right to it. I often recall, and perhaps you have already heard, the story of an encounter I had with an old white woman in Siberia. During one of my visits to a parish to replace a sick priest, the nuns who lived in this small parish asked me to take communion to an old lady who could not move. They also told me that this old lady was of German origins. So she spoke a language, a mixture between German and Russian, and that I had to pay attention to this during her confession. They also told me that in the 1930s, they had killed two children, her two children before her eyes. So anyway, I got to this place. I, ca I gave her confession and said mass. And I think at that time I was a little bit proud as a young priest and also a bit curious at the end of the day. I gave in to the temptation to ask her, what do you think of Stalin to this old woman? And she widened her eyes and answered, what do I think of Stalin? Well, what do you think, what do you want me to think? I forgave him. Otherwise, how could I have kept on living? I remember returning to Novosibirsk without saying a word, and my eyes were full of tears. But also, the experience of forgiveness in the parish, in the north of, in the north of Russia, in an area which unfortunately is quite well known for the concentration camps. I was very struck by the fact of seeing at these celebrations, at these parishes of 10 to 12 people, but I was often very struck 
by the people of these parishes who were the descendants of deportees and torturers. They participate in the same celebrations. I found this very moving. What moves me is to see their enthusiasm, their gladness, despite being so few of them and maybe a bit along with their age, of, of, of going towards old age. Rarely have I found such normal and spontaneous joy arising from forgiveness which has not forgotten what happened and or overcome it in some way and gone beyond it, but it is a true act of forgiveness that I see. I also recall a dialogue with a Ukrainian girl who had been recalled to take up arms and join the army join the efforts in the war. To her, we had talked about forgiveness. To her somewhat angry question, which rightly so was posed in an angry way. So my brother has to go and get himself killed. Why? I replied that her brother should certainly take up a rifle and kill or be killed to defend his homeland because the homeland in some moments on certain occasions is an important value it can require you to put your life on the line so he had to either decide to be killed or kill himself But I told her, if your brother does not forgive without forgiveness, her brother will carry his hatred with him all his life and will bring it to, with him to the grave. And if he kills the other, the enemy, without forgiveness, he will have lost out on the opportunity for this brother to, on the opportunity of the conversion of his enemy into a brother. Of course, one can object, make many objections that this isn't possible. But in any case, what I want to say is that it is not possible to evade the experience of forgiveness in order to continue living. Even the experience of the wife of a, of a policeman from CL, killed in Rome by the Red Brigades, to whom Father Giussani said, forgive them. It will be useful for your children, to your children. It goes in the same vein. Without Without the experience of forgiveness, you cannot live. Peace and reconciliation are about relations between men, or at least one of them must be humanity, a human factor. I, in this sense, I was very pleased that the title of this meeting spoke of artisans, peacemakers, and not just of practitioners, of builders of peace and reconciliation. With this, I do not want to belittle the expression builder, operator. But the fact is that what strikes me about the use of the word artisan is that he is totally involved. He manipulates reality in his hands according to the destiny inscribed in that reality. That is, peace is peace and that's it. Reconciliation is reconciliation and that's it. 
being artisans means, first of all, calling things by their proper name. And then also being an artisan makes, it has to do with passion for peace. And it talks about pleasure in trying to, in, these, in, the, efforts, in the efforts for reconciliation. Who has not been moved watching the smile, smiling face of Pope Francis as he lowered himself to kiss the feet of the warlords of South Sudan, if I am not mistaken, and they were all Christians. Peggy, talking about his mother stuffing chairs, says she did this with a passion and dedication in doing that job. To stuff chairs was to proclaim Christ, was to build Christianity. For me, being a craftsman of peace means responding to the mystery of God who has called me in Christ. It means responding to my ministry as a Catholic bishop. And this makes me build peace, first of all, in myself. This is the task that I have been given as a Catholic bishop. So I need to build this peace, first of all, within myself. I need peace too. I need serenity. Otherwise, what will I communicate? And then, in my relationship with the people who have been entrusted to me, and finally, with the reality in which I find myself. That is why I never tire of inviting forgiveness, inviting people to forgiveness within their families, within their work. And that would be an interesting topic to go deep into the experience of forgiveness in the battle, as it were, between colleagues who compete to hire their careers. It is this responding to Christ which helps me forgive. It enables me to see the positive, the goodness of the other who is different to me. We could say it in a mathematical sense. There are, there, there are times which I discover a certain hatred within myself towards others. And if I stop and think about this, I realize that this absence of peace within me is that I have not truly forgiven this person in my heart yet. Even if I have, maybe in a formal sense, verbally, I have not yet asked of, for Christ to give me the strength to make space for that forgiveness in me. But when I do this, it is not a question, a question, it is not a, happens my, it doesn't happen by magic. But when it happens, a serenity and gladness takes over my heart. When the concern to build, uh, then suddenly everything becomes, takes over, then suddenly everything becomes clouded, obscured, judgment becomes political compromise. As a girl told me at a meeting, there's no longer a truth shared by everybody. There are only justifications, partial ideological truths. In Russian, this sounds better because you use the words istina and pravda. I think the latter is familiar to you, at least to the older ones, because they will remember the ideological regime newspaper Pravda. This can clearly be seen when certain values are emphasized by power, any power. At one time, one could, would say common values 
today one would say Christian or religious values. We must judge the difference between religious values and common values. So if these values are take on an ideological accent, then the values turn against themselves. The contradiction of the love towards the homeland, which is a great value, leads to identifying in an earthly power the truth that gathers around the values of that, that sustains the value of peace. So that these same values in the hands of an earthly power become a justification for violence. It is well known that every power feels itself the bearer of a messianic or at least utopian call. Solzhenitsyn speaks of this messianic temptation of Lenin in Zurich. Once back home in Russia, he will try at all costs to realize this messianism, even at a very high price of human lives. This temptation will only be momentarily shaken by a fleeting thought. Somewhere I found it written that Lenin is said to have said, we will give electricity to the Soviets, to the Soviet man, but we can never give them, we will never be able to give them happiness. In any case, I think that our situation is even worse. If the Romans were able to sustain the paradox, if you want peace, prepare for war. Because in those days, without Christ, when Christ still hadn't come, war was a tool for settling legal disputes. That was the way things were settled. But in our 21st century, with the growth and increase of open conflicts in the Middle East, Africa and Europe, and other conflicts not, uh, not veiled at all or hidden in Asia and Af America, all of this does nothing but introduce the debacle, the debate of a coexistence between men for which Pope Francis speaks of, of a third world war in pieces, a fragmented third world war across the globe. In front of this, despair seems a normal response. It seems like it would, it seems like a normal response. And yet, no, Peggy is still right when he says that despair is the last shore of diabolic pride. Because despair extraneates you from your own experience, from the experience of the human. The human is opposed The, it is opposed in opposition to the experience of desire, the experience of sadness, that nostalgia, that desire for peace and reconciliation that makes us want to respond to the mystery, to accept forgiveness, and to oppose the human is opposed to the arrogance of power. This is the experience of forgiveness, which literally reconstructs humanity. Forty years ago, Saint Pope John Paul II concluded here at the meeting by saying, build the new civilization of truth and love, 
pray for this, work for this, suffer for this. I think that this announcement, prophetic for those times, is still relevant today. Thank you for your attention. Grazie. Grazie di cuore, Monsignor Petz. Thank you, Monsignor Petzi, for, for these important words and nothing else, just not only for the words you've told us, but for this, the witness to the, the difficult situation you're living in. And I think that this, there's not much more we can add to this. I'll just, I'll say one quick thing. All of these three witnesses we have here you know, could have deserved a, a, a conference on the, just on their own to explore what they've lived through. But this, this, pr the profundity of what we've, what they've told us here, is in and of itself a, a testimony, a proof that there's one experience that defines everywhere in the world, one presence that begins to create a new world, even in situations where, from a certain point of view, you could think is is hopeless. Yet, through the, what these three have told us, these places become a, a site of hope. Not because of what we do, but because there's someone else behind it. Thank you, and have a great meeting, all the rest of you.
perché l'aspettavano così? Perché credo in quello che dico. Questo è basta? Sì. Sani ha generato un popolo e io faccio parte di questo popolo. L'avvenimento in cui Dio entra nella nostra esistenza e tutti colpiti da una curiosità sospendono per un istante l'ora e guardano dalla parte dove viene Dio. Questa la finiamo.